Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. The U.S. and Western allies are preparing to roll out new sanctions against Russia. The move comes as Secretary of State Antony Blinken is meeting with NATO allies in Brussels. The White House also says it's preparing to send $100 million worth of anti-tank missiles to Ukraine. Meanwhile, the Department of Justice laid out some new actions against Russia today, unsealing an indictment charging a Russian oligarch with sanctions and announcing the disruption of a global botnet run by the Russian Military Intelligence Agency. The announcement comes after authorities seized a super yacht owned by a sanctioned Russian oligarch as well. Meanwhile, we're seeing some graphic new images showing the destruction outside Ukraine's capital as we learn more about alleged atrocities by Russian soldiers against civilians. Foreign correspondent James Longman starts us off from a devastated town west of Kyiv. As Ukraine reclaims land that Russian forces had occupied for weeks, unimaginable horror has somehow got even worse. In the town of Borodyanka, atrocities like those in Bukha are starting to be uncovered, but Russians were here for longer, and so the fear of what might be found is deeper. We've made it to the town of Borodyanka, this is northwest of Bucha, and somehow, I didn't, didn't know it was possible, but the devastation is even worse. I mean, look at that, that's an apartment building, uh, just sort of chopped in half. We traveled to Bucha and saw for ourselves the horrors meted out on the civilian population. At a church, graphic images of what appears to be yet another mass grave. You can see maybe six or seven bodies in black bags. There may well be more beneath the earth. This town is now one big crime scene. We spoke with a team from Human Rights Watch who are investigating potential war crimes here. We've been moving through areas that have been previously occupied by Russian forces and trying to identify places where there have been possible violations of the laws of war. Aid is finally starting to arrive, food and medicine, and the psychological support so many here will need. Aliona is a spokeswoman for the Red Cross, but she's also Ukrainian. So I think it makes it easier to be able to do something uh, and help respond to the most urgent of the needs. You feel useful? Yes. In an address to the United Nations Security Council, President Zelensky pointed to the atrocities and he called on the world to act. So they died there in suffering. They were killed in their apartments, houses, blowing up grenades. The civilians were crushed by tanks while sitting in the, their cars in the middle of the road just for their pleasure. He added that if no action is taken by the organization, the UN should be simply closed. And in front of the UN, the US is now pushing for Russia to be suspended from the Human Rights Council. The US ambassador to the United Nations pointing to reports that Russia is forcing Ukrainians into filtration camps where families are separated and tens of thousands are forced to relocate to Russia. I do not need to spell out what these so-called filtration camps are reminiscent of. It's chilling and we cannot look away. The UN now says over 11 million people have been forced to flee their homes since the war began. But there are those unable to escape. In Mariupol, Russian forces have besieged and bombarded the city for weeks, leaving thousands trapped. This is the main road, Diane, that leads out of Kyiv uh, towards towns like Bucha and Borodyanka, where we've been able to visit. You can see the, the cleanup is underway. Uh, there was a massive battle that took place here for control of this road. This is, uh, these are Russian military vehicles. The charred remains are still blocking this highway. The war around Kyiv may be over, but it's the discovery of all kinds of atrocities that are now dominating people's minds here. Diane. All right, James Longman in Borodjenka, Ukraine. Thank you. Meanwhile, the U.S. and its allies are imposing more sanctions, banning all new investment in Russia, increasing sanctions on major Russian financial institutions, and targeting Russian government officials and their family members, including Putin's own two daughters. Let's bring in ABC News political director Rick Klein for more. Rick, we're expecting to hear more about these sanctions from President Biden today. So what impact do you think they could have? Well, I just talked uh, earlier this morning at a news conference with a, uh, a, a top economic uh, advisor to President Biden, and the idea is to squeeze as many different sectors of the economy as possible in ways that are very personal when it comes to Putin's inner circle and even his family members, and very broad when it comes to taking these steps against uh, some of the largest financial institutions inside of Russia. The idea that, um, that, that they won't be able to tr conduct transactions on the international market, uh, the predictions from the administration is this is going to put a, a major pressure 
pressure on the Russian economy, a further cratering of the ruble and of all of uh, all of industry in Russia. And ultimately, the hope on the American side is that it puts more pressure on Putin to reconsider this strategy because it hurts his people, uh, both in the very broad sense as well as the very local sense and the personal sense. And this move to, to stop any U.S. individual from any further investments in Russia, again, just choking off any financial lifeline that the American government can find. Yeah, and, and as we mentioned, the Department of Justice also announced new actions indicting a Russian oligarch, seizing a super yacht owned by another, and shutting down a dark web marketplace used to get around sections. Uh, how impactful are those moves? Look, it's an open question because we've heard from the White House the, the initial hope that the, that the sanctions that were imposed would stop the invasion. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, President Biden saying after the fact they weren't really about deterring. Uh, but still now we're in a position where every time we ratchet this up, it puts a little more pressure on the White House to actually deliver something out of these things. And it has an impact here back home. Markets are a little bit rattled again by the idea that the U.S. government's going to go after more Russian institutions because we live in this international uh, economic uh, world where all of the things that happen there are, are impacting us as well. I, I don't think anyone at the White House is, is selling this here as the panacea, but their, their hope and their expectation is that this is going to really cripple Putin. And I think it's a bit of a black box about whether that puts pressure on him on a personal level, but uh, no one likes to get their, uh, their fun toys taken away. And that, that, I think, is the hope that the oligarchs suffering means Putin is going to feel it. Now, the U.S. is also sending another $100 million worth of anti-tank missiles to Ukraine. How significant is that? Look, I think any time that there's more military aid, the Ukrainians are going to welcome it. But the pace at which that they're, they're using these weapons far outstrips the supply that's coming in. And if indeed we're talking about a very long, uh, slow military advance slash uh, attempted occupation, uh, there really isn't, this is not going to be, I think, seen as, a, as an amount that is equivalent with the need on the Ukrainian side. And of course, we know President Zelensky has still called for more. He still does want to see a no-fly zone uh, that has been ruled out continually by the American side. And the White House also announced that it'll extend the pause on federal student loan payments until August. Now, the administration has been under pressure by some to forgive those loans entirely. Is this a step in that direction? Potentially. I, I think the hope among some progressive groups is that it is that, although this is not something that President Biden has said he wants. This is an area, frankly, where the administration caved to some liberal pressure that was mounted as, uh, as, the, as the newest deadline comes up. And it's a little bit uh, at odds with the contention from the administration that the economy is booming uh, and that the, the, the COVID-19 restrictions uh, and, 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 and different uh, steps that were put in place because of COVID-19 are no longer necessary. So it, it kind of cuts in a different direction. But there's no question that there's a a lot of cheering right now among people who have student loans themselves or see this as a core issue. It was such an animating issue early in the uh, the pre-pandemic days of the 2020 primary, where frankly Joe Biden was an outlier among some of his rivals in not wanting student loans to be forgiven at the federal level altogether. And oil executives are testifying on Capitol Hill today about skyrocketing gas prices. President Biden has blamed energy companies for profiting off what he calls Putin's price hike. So is that fair? How are these companies defending their practices and how contentious is this issue? Well, the, we, Democrats are looking for a new villain in the gas price wars. They recognize that it's a political liability, to say the least. People don't blame Putin entirely. They give him some blame for this, but gas prices were rising before the war in Ukraine. And the, the global supply issues that, the, that those oil executives are talking about right now uh, predate this war by, by a good margin. Their point is they don't set the prices at gas pumps. The world market and then very individual uh, competitive pressures of supply and demand do. They, yes, they're beginning to increase production, but the same supply chain chain and labor shortages that are uh, plaguing other portions of the economy hurt them as well. And frankly, the decisions that they made a couple of years ago when the price of oil was low about what production levels uh, to, to set uh, are, are still being felt right now because it takes a while. You can't just start, lease, uh, start, start drilling and, and producing tomorrow just because you have a lease. So they say they're taking those steps, but it is going to take some time. They're pleading for patience. At the same time, they are making record profits uh, as a result of this globally high price of oil. All right, ABC News political director Rick Klein, we appreciate it as always. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Coming up, new details on the unprecedented COVID lockdown in Shanghai as an FDA panel meets today to discuss the future of boosters here in the U.S.
Welcome back to ABC News Live. A new severe weather threat is on the move for parts of the South after a tough 48 hours of storms left two people dead, one in Texas and another in Georgia. At least 41 twisters have been reported in at least five states. The system is now moving into the Southeast with major cities like Birmingham and Atlanta in its path. The Oklahoma House has approved a bill that would make performing an abortion a felony punishable by up to 10 years in prison. The move sparked protests in support of abortion rights at the Capitol. The bill is one of a number of anti-abortion measures still on the table in Oklahoma's legislature this year. And two Republican lawmakers in Ohio have introduced a bill inspired by Florida's so-called Don't Say Gay law. The bill would ban kindergarten through third grade classrooms from teaching or referencing sexual orientation or gender identity. An FDA panel is meeting today to discuss the future of COVID booster shots here in the U.S. It comes as nearly 26 million people have been confined to their homes in a mass COVID-19 lockdown in Shanghai. Children who test positive are even being separated from their parents. Britt Clinton is in Hong Kong with the latest on that. Hi, Britt. Diane Shanghai reporting record COVID infections again on Wednesday. China's largest city still under lockdown. That's more than 25 million people confined to their homes as they undergo several rounds of testing. Now, officials have called the situation extremely grim, blaming the fast-moving Omicron variant. But this is proving to be the biggest challenge to the resilience of China's zero COVID strategy since the pandemic began. There are also growing signs of frustration, especially Especially over a policy that separates children who test positive from their COVID negative parents. Authorities say this is vital to prevention and control work, but unverified images shared online appear to show several toddlers kept together in cribs at a Shanghai clinic, and this is causing outrage. However, the clinic said that this footage was taken during an internal move and don't reflect what actually happened. Concern there also over food supplies, with some saying it's been difficult to obtain daily necessities. Shanghai has also converted an exhibition hall and other facilities into isolation centres where people with mild or no symptoms stay in beds separated by petitions. Now, foreign residents have also been brought into these huge isolation halls and have been describing the conditions there. There are no showers here and we're not allowed to receive any parcels from the outside world, so we cannot, cannot order any food or anything from, uh, from home. And the Chinese government has sent in tens of thousands of health workers from all across the country to Shanghai to try and fight this outbreak, including thousands of military personnel. Let's not forget, Shanghai is an economic powerhouse. It's China's financial capital. It's a major shipping centre. So when this outbreak started to escalate, authorities thought they would take a softer approach and cause as little disruption as possible. That looks to have failed because if you take, for instance, Shenzhen and Dongguan together, they're about the same size as Shanghai. Their outbreak started at about the same time as Shanghai too. But the authorities there used the full hardline toolkit and locked down straight away. Today, they're out of lockdown, unlike uh, Shanghai. So this again highlights the challenges with this strategy with varying results across the country, posing the question of just how sustainable this is for the country in the long term. Diane? All right, Britt Clinton in Hong Kong, thank you. And while the war in Ukraine has shown us the worst of humanity, the best of it is also coming through. One Syrian man all too familiar with what it's like to be uprooted from his home has made it his calling to help other refugees as they cross the border into neighboring Romania. Maggie Ruley has his story. <laughs> it starts with a smile at the border, a warm hello for people living through one of the darkest moments of their lives. And uh, we are taking one family now. And then a heartfelt welcome to a new home, a place with the expected essentials, clean clothes, diapers and soap, but also small homey touches. The, the lavender and everything, I mean, it, it makes it feel so welcoming. And come dinner time. Yes, it's the spicy. Uh... Volunteers and refugees cook and sit down for a meal together. Very tasty. Omar Al-Shakal's nonprofit, Refugee for Refugees, is on the ground in Romania, helping Ukrainians as they flee the war. No. These are all donations. Yeah. Omar tells us every refugee deserves to feel like a human, and he's determined to give these people the welcome he wishes he had. This is actually what we are 
what we are trying to provide here, a safe area where people can come to rest for a few hours or a night. Omar fled Syria in 2014 at 17 years old. He had been jailed and shot and was forced to escape, eventually swimming 14 hours to make it to the coast of Greece. We were really lucky, like we made it. In the middle of the night, we just thought, like, we are going to die in the middle of the sea. But those first few years in this new land often felt impossible. Of course, I was trying to learn the language, but it was hard. He felt lost, he says, until he started volunteering. And in 2017, he started Refugee for Refugees, a nonprofit rooted in the shared refugee experience. Beautiful sunset. And made up of a diverse group of volunteers from Asia, Africa, and Europe. When war broke out in Ukraine, Omar says he knew he had to help flying to the border and finding this house in Romania to use as a temporary home base while his team works on building a larger home next door. And this door, made up of donated items, a place refugees can come and take what they need. It's here we find Natalie. She left Kyiv two days ago and just made it to Omar's place in Romania. <laughs> like so many who flee, she left with just what she could carry, including her little Pomeranian, Rish. What was that like? How long were you there when it was under attack? She tells us that most wealthy people living in Kyiv got out right away, but she says she doesn't have much money and didn't know if she could afford to escape. For her, she says finding Omar's place is a miracle. Please, Melody. It means a safe home to get settled in, a foundation, a new start. Well, I'm very happy you're here now <laughs> Thank you. and, and feel safe and that your, your little guy there looks pretty content in your arms, doesn't he? <laughs> Thank you. Little things that Omar says remind us everyone is human. <laughs> it's a mantra Omar carries, even though he says it's hard to ignore how the world has responded to Ukrainian refugees compared to people like himself from Syria. Now the unthinkable has happened to them. And this is not a developing third world nation. This is Europe. On parle pas là de Syriens qui fuient qui fuient des bombardements du régime syrien soutenu par Vladimir Poutine. On parle d'Européens qui partent leur voiture, qui rassemblent à nos voitures, qui prennent la route et qui essayent juste de sauver leur vie quoi. Et ça c'est une question. Do you feel like there's been a double standard for refugees based on their skin? 100%. Why do you think there's so much attention and care right now for Ukrainian refugees compared to these other refugee crises? I, it's a really hard question, mm. but I'm going to answer like what they said in the news mm. because of the religion. They mm. said some of the politicians in Europe, they make it very clear. Those people believe in the same religion we believe. That's why we are helping them. Because they are scared of Muslim people or they are scared of those people from different country. A double standard that Omar says cuts him to his very core. But he also understands those fleeing aren't just news headlines. They're people in need of help. We don't care about where they are from. We don't care about their religion. We don't care if they are black or white. Because, as he knows all too well, life as a refugee can't be fixed with a nice temporary home. And the pull of going back to your real home never really goes away. If tomorrow, like, I believe Syria is safe for me, I will leave immediately, <laughs> immediately, without even thinking. Syria is still home. Yeah, Syria is still yeah. home, and it will be always home. It's interesting because every, pretty much everyone we've spoken with that has fled Ukraine says the same thing, that they'll go back the second they can. Because no one left, because... <sighs> They want that everyone left because they have to live. That's why they need to return back to their home. Even almost like eight or nine years, I still have the hope. Like I'm going back to my, to my city, to my place, to my house. Different wars, different countries, but refugees united by being violently uprooted and left forever longing to get back home. Our thanks to Maggie Ruley for that report. Coming up, the historic move by Amazon warehouse workers here in New York. The president of the new Amazon labor union joins us live when we come back.
Welcome back. Amazon warehouse workers in New York made history last Friday, voting to unionize its Staten Island facility. It's the first successful U.S. organizing effort in the retail giant's 27-year history. Amazon labor union president Christian Smalls is here to tell us more about it. Christian, thanks for being here. I want to start from the beginning. What prompted the formation of this union to begin with? Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, my, my journey started two years ago when I was terminated from a company. You know, after I was terminated, you know, they had a meeting about me, Jeff Bezos and the general counsel calling me not smart or articulate. And ironically, they also said to make me the face of the whole unionizing efforts. So from that moment, you know, I traveled the country protesting and advocating for workers' rights up until about 11 months ago when we founded the Amazon Labor Union, the ALU, in Staten Island. Uh, we founded this uh, this union because we went down to Alabama last year. We saw some opportunities that uh, we thought that we can do better up here. And we uh, we formed this new worker-led independent union. And it's been uh, working for us up here in Staten Island. And uh, here we are. Uh, as of April 1st, we became the first union to, uh, for Amazon in the country. Now, the Amazon labor union is made up of both current and former Staten Island employees. How did you garner that support? Well, you know, uh, that was my former facility. You know, I opened up that facility in 2018. I was a supervisor with Amazon for almost four and a half years. So um, I felt it was necessary to go back home, pretty much. Um, the workers know who I am. They've seen who I was in uh, the media as far as protesting. Um, and the organizers that I organized with, um, they're current employees. You know, they all work there. They know the ins and outs of the company. They know the grievances. We live the reality of the warehouse lifestyle. And we felt that this was the best way to go to try to unionize Amazon and uh, it absolutely worked for us. You know, work has resonated with us and we built their, you know, we built relationships, earned their trust. And over time, um, you know, we were able to sign up over 4,000 workers. And Christian, warehouse workers voted 55 to 45 in favor of the union. What was your reaction to those results? Honestly, I wish it was a lot higher, but um, unfortunately, Amazon spends millions of dollars uh, uh, union busting. They put these workers into captive audiences 24-7. You know, workers go to these trainings where they're, they're fed and drilled anti-union propaganda all day and all night. So we expected a lot of misinformation to be out there um, as far as uh, when the vote came. And we expected workers to, you know, just have to make their own conscious decision and, um, you know, we were fortunate enough to have enough to win. But um, I think it would be a lot higher had Amazon not been able to spend millions of dollars trying to stop this campaign. Now, Amazon released a statement saying in part, quote, we're disappointed with the outcome of the election in Staten Island because we believe having a direct relationship with the company is best for our employees. What's your reaction to that? Well, you know, um, I know Amazon's going to say something like that, but uh, unfortunately, um, that's not the case. You know, Amazon workers had the right, the fair right to vote, whichever favor they chose, and the workers spoke for themselves. So th to be disappointed that their own workers voted yes is, is just utterly uh, ridiculous, if you ask me. And, um, you know, the workers said that they want a union, and they voted in that favor, and that they should just uh, acknowledge that and accept that and recognize the union um, in Staten Island. Uh, but the company indicated that it will explore options to challenge this vote. What could that look like? I don't. I don't believe the board would entertain that. You know how does how does uh, the the board that actually ran the election interfere with the election? That's just ridiculous. I I was uh, able to also sitting, and we had observers on both sides. I seen that the election was ran ran fairly and consistently. Um, there was no issues really on our end. And I don't see how a trillion dollar company will have any type of disputes. You know, the, the election was held in person. The voters voted in person. It was live counting on as far as the ballots. And um, the, the workers voted up um, in favor of the, the union. So here we are. All right. Amazon Labor Union President Christian Smalls, we appreciate your time today. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And thank you at home for joining us. I'm Diane Macedo. Do stay with us. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.